Are you in the market for a violin? I'm Ryan Thompson. I've got some useful information for you. First of all, I'd like to show you a violin that I picked up at a flea market. This is a violin that was sitting in the case and it had some obvious problems with it. So I picked it up and I started looking for other things, looking at all the details. I looked at the back of the violin, I looked at the scroll, I looked at the tuning pegs to see how they were made and how they fit. I took a look at the tailpiece and how the tailpiece worked. I looked at the strings that were already on the violin. I looked at the chin rest. I looked at the tailpiece back here. I looked at some of the joints and how it was put together. I looked at the angle of the fingerboard. And what I discovered was it had a top crack in it. On the belly of the violin or the top of the violin, there's a crack that runs right along here. You can probably see it here in the picture. Now, I know that a crack in this particular location is not a difficult crack to repair. I can send this over to my violin maker friend, there's a luthier who does repair work in the area, and he's going to be able to fix this up pretty quickly. It's not going to cost very much. Now, there are some areas in the violin that are very expensive to repair. Certain cracks are very difficult to repair. I know that these strings are old strings, and they need to be replaced. The violin's missing a bridge. It's missing the piece of wood that holds the strings up. Now, it's not going to be hard to have a violin bridge made and have a new bridge fit and put on the violin. And I looked at the tuning pegs, and I can see that, that one of the pegs doesn't fit very well. So as soon as it had the strings hooked up into it and you tried to tighten the strings, it wasn't going to stay in place and there's going to be a problem. The strings are going to slip. So I can see that the pegs need to be reshaped a bit. One of them does. The other three seem to, be, seem to fit pretty well. And so someone might say, well, why did you buy this violin if it needed all these repairs? Well, that's because I have a, an idea about the difficulty of the repairs. I know they're not difficult to repair. And, I, and considering the cost of the violin at the flea market plus the cost of the violin to be repaired, uh, once I pay that, this violin is going to be worth far more than it was when I bought it at the flea market, even considering the cost of the repairs. So that's a good deal. Now, I'm buying this violin to actually play. I'm not buying it because it's a valuable violin. It's a nice violin, but it's not an extremely valuable one. So this, this is information that's useful for the average person if you're going out to buy a violin. Hopefully you'll find a violin that's in better condition to this. Now the reason I'm showing you some of the things to look for in a violin is because I've written a book called The Fiddle and Violin Buyer's Guide where I've already done a lot of this work for you. And this is information that I put together myself in this book to help you find the best violin that you can buy for your budget and what your budget will allow. Now this book isn't written for violin experts, for violin dealers, or for people that do professional violin repair work. This book is written for the average person so that you can learn more about violins. Perhaps you're a parent and you're buying a violin for your son or your daughter. Perhaps you have an old violin sitting in the attic and you don't know whether it might be worth a lot. You might want to sell it or you might want to trade it for something and you want to find out a little bit more about it. And what I've done in my book is talked about the different parts of a violin and which parts are higher quality than other parts, what the options are for all the different parts. So you can evaluate a violin that maybe you're going to purchase or maybe a violin you already own. This book isn't designed for valuable violins, violins that are over fifteen dollars or $20,000. This violin that you would be looking at using my book to evaluate it would be a, a violin that's down in the lower range, it, perhaps a student instrument, perhaps a decent instrument for someone that was a, an amateur violin player that played four or five times a week. But that's where most people are at when they're buying violins. What I've done in here is I've made a checklist of all the different parts of the violin. These are parts that you can examine yourself. I've talked about all the different options for construction, the different types of wood that are used in the different parts, and what to look for. What kind of danger signs and warning signs might alert you to a violin that needs serious work. And then what sort of things that can go wrong that are fairly easy to fix and fairly inexpensive to fix. And when I examine each one of the parts, I write a description of the part and some of the things that go into the part so you can learn more about how violins are made and how they're used. And I'll, get, I'll read a little bit here. This is the section about the belly or the top of the violin, which is the part that we were talking about before with the top crack. And I'm going to read a little bit on that section for you. The belly is almost always made of carved spruce and good fiddles although some newly made violins have tops which are pressed into shape by machines rather than being hand carved. Although carved tops are superior, pressed tops may be satisfactory for low-priced student instruments. 
The upper surface should always retain the original carved shape and not be warped. One type of warping occurs when a fiddle is strung up for a long period of time with no sound post in place. Now a sound post is a little piece of wood that you can't see unless you look down inside of the F-holes. And if you look down inside the F-holes, you'll see a little piece of a dowel. It's a little maple dowel that's standing up and it's holding the top of the violin up to support it against the pressure of the strings. So a violin needs the sound posts in there and this will tell you about what a sound post should look like and how to tell whether or not the sound post is in the right place because oftentimes you'll find a used fiddle for sale or a violin and the sound post will be in the violin but it'll be in the wrong place for the optimal sound and so you'll need to have that adjusted. Now that can be done easily by anyone who's a luthier or a violin maker but just knowing about that is going to help you make a decision when you go to buy an instrument. Let me read a little bit more. Most violins, even high quality ones, will develop cracks at some point in their lives. Cracks in the top can usually be repaired easily and relatively inexpensively, but this job requires experience and the proper tools. The wood in this area is thin and cracks can occur from age, improper fitting, and improper placement of the sound post, quick changes in temperature, or from rough treatment. So what I've done is gone through with all the different parts of the violin and I talk about each one and what kind of things to look out for. So this is kind of a guide, a do-it-yourself guide to finding yourself a decent violin. There's even a little chapter in the back on left-handed violins. There's folks now that are starting to play left-handed violin and so I've got a whole little section on how to look to find a left-handed violin or what is entailed in, in creating a left-handed violin by having a right-handed violin modified. Now another important part about violin playing is the bow the violin bow. So I've got a whole section on violin bows where I describe the, the structure of the, this is called the frog, this part of the bow here. This is a hollowed out piece of wood and the violin, the bow hair is into the frog. So there's a section on the construction and what things to look out for in the frog and how you can tell a good bow from a, a inexpensive bow, a poorly made bow and what to look for. I think this book's really useful. Uh, lots and lots of people have purchased it and had a, a really good luck with it. And I've received a lot of emails back and letters from people that have had this book with them when they go to purchase a violin. And you can purchase this. Um, you can get it online through my website at captainfiddle.com. You can read about it. You can either buy it directly off the website or if you want to do it the old-fashioned way, you can send me a check. And if you want information about the book, just uh, send me an email and I'll tell you a little bit more about it. But I think it's a great book. It's inexpensive. You might be able to find a real bargain with this book. This probably isn't going to help you find a real Stradivarius, but this is going to help you find something useful that you can play. I don't talk much in the book about prices that you should pay, how much a violin should cost, because the prices on the violin are all over the board. I, I bought violins for $5 at the flea market. I see violins for sale that are $25,000 in the music store. But this will get you in line to get a decent violin for the average person to play and this will give you the information that you need to seek out the violin yourself do it yourself purchase and um, so that's all I have to say about that right now I hope that you'll go to my website and take a look it's at captainfiddle.com and take a look at my uh, fiddle and violin buyers guide